introduce uh, today two very experienced uh, uh, teachers. Uh, we have uh, Alex Kremer from the Federal University of Technology in Paraná, Brazil, uh, who is an engineer and is working with this uh, um, collective intelligence. And uh, on the other side, we have uh, Francesco Goisis from the uh, State University of Milan. And uh, Francesco is a lawyer, He's, uh, he's does uh, administrative and public law. So today we are going to share those two uh, different uh, uh, experiences uh, and uh, knowledges uh, and uh, so we will see <laughs> what we, we can learn from them. So I think we can introduce them. Thank you, thank you very so much. Uh, thank you very much, Miriam. Uh, I think I will sort of get stuck to that place because I'm never, I'm never very confident comfortable with these things here, so I may have to switch back to the, <laughs> so I will be behind, hide, hiding behind here, but it's mainly because I may not be, be able to use this thing, although it's, yeah, sometimes we, we, we work so much with technology these days that the simplest technologies are the ones that uh, are more troubles uh, uh, to us in many cases. Uh, all right, uh, the idea that we have here when I, w I started discussing this uh, with Francesco about two months ago. Uh, was to present a little bit of how what we call collective intelligent, intelligence can help the smart cities of the future and in fact can even change a little bit the, the, the focus that sometimes we have, the, 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 the focus that is too much on, on the technology itself and uh, focus a little more on the people uh, that live in those cities where that, that we, we, we wish to turn into into smart cities, right? And then uh, Francesco having this uh, uh, legal uh, uh, backgrounds probably will, uh, be able, will be able to also uh, tell us a, a little bit about the challenges that we may face in the future because of this. Because when we are involved with the technology, sometimes we're so enthusiastic about it that we, we, we think about our, uh, the purposes that we have for right now and we think, I solved this problem, but then we generate a series of other problems and uh, so there's a lot of issues concerning even our privacy. Uh, there's all the environmental concerns that I, I know that uh, Francesco is very keen uh, about there. Even some uh, things related to human rights. We think that we're doing things to turn uh, human life better, but we, we many times as engineers, and, and I'm, I, 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 this is the only situation in which I'm really proud of still be having a, an engineering diploma because I say engineers fix problems of the world but we, we're usually not the best people to generate the big questions. Someone gives us the, the problem and we solve it, but we solve it uh, as, as a little pattern in, in something that is much bigger. And I think that uh, society has to discuss this in, in, in bigger terms. So, see, I'll, 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 just go, no, I'll just go for this. It will probably, oh, maybe I have to go here. Uh, and, oh, see, it does work. So, uh, the agenda for today, Understanding collective intelligence from, at least from, from the perspective that we want to, to give to it and then understanding a bit of what we think that smart cities are or should be. You know, uh, there, is a lot, there is a battle right now to define what smart cities in the future are and I know that there are people that are here specifically because they are studying uh, smart cities but there is this thing, where do we focus? On the technology, on the people uh, and uh, so, so I'll have to show where we're standing there. Uh, then we'll, I'll have to discuss a little bit about this uh, concept of bottom-up strategy, uh, which is a little chaotic for sure, because it means that the base of the pyramid starts dictating, starts saying what is important to, to it. And, and the base of the pyramid here being the citizens. Uh, uh, and the citizens start moving, not only providing the administration, the local administration in cities, uh, or, or other, other levels of administration with ideas, but in many cases say, okay, if you're not getting it, we will do it ourselves, right? So there's a little bit, in, this is not only defining a strategy, but also executing a strategy from the citizens. Uh, then uh, I'll give you a few examples of things that we have been attempting in my research group. Uh, Miriam has introduced me just as, uh, as an engineer. I am uh, a professor at, a com uh, at applied computing uh, program in, in Brazil, but I'm also in the business program. So uh, I, I see the perspective of the, the, the engineers uh, at one side and at the other side we're dealing with uh, administrators that have to deal with that, uh, those technologies, right? And uh, so we'll provide you with some of the, the examples of things that we've been trying to do 
some of it, some of them are a, a little more successful, and others not as much. And I will give you some uh, insights on, on what that's happened. And then, well, the, the, all the implications. It's actually the last bit here, but it's actually half of it. It's uh, all what Francesco will be doing there. Okay, so understanding collective intelligence. Uh, uh, I find that there, there are many definitions for that, uh, and uh, I find that there are two of them that are uh, more interesting because of the, the, the feelings that they, they, um, de that they develop on people, right? Uh, one of them is by uh, Thomas Malone, a professor at the MIT. He says that collective intelligence is a group of people doing something that seems intelligent. It doesn't even have to be intelligent. He says, if it seems intelligent, it's already collective intelligence in action. And it, I took a while to understand what he was meaning, and I'm not even sure if, if what my explanation to his ideas, he would agree with it. But now I think that I, you know, some 10 years later, uh, actually little, even more than that, uh, I think I, I understand what he means that collective intelligence is already on people seeming to be doing something intelligent. It is because he focused a lot on the process of collective intelligence that is actually people gathering together and trying to solve a problem, right? So if you see co uh, some coordination, some cooperation, or even some distribution of tasks, that is already, there is already some uh, uh, human intelligence happening in a collective way, right? Uh, and this is uh, what Malone would call uh, collective intelligence. I have to admit that I, I'm more inspired by Pierre Lévy's definition of collective intelligence. Pierre Lévy is this uh, French philosopher who, when uh, trying to you know, tell the world why he thought that collective intelligence was important, he said, every human in this planet knows something that nobody else does. So all of us, in other words, all of us are very important to this world because we have a little piece of knowledge that if shared with the rest of the world can make us all better. Maybe can, can make us all have a world that doesn't only seem better, but that is really better. So I like it for this uh, possibility of showing that diversity is really important uh, for the collective. Uh, and uh, so I'll, 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 most of the research that we do, and, and, and when we apply computing to what we do, we try to be inspired by this definition. We, we want, we, knowing that each one of us has some knowledge that nobody else has, how can we foster or harness all these different pieces of knowledge and put them together in a way that respecting each other we build a better world. Okay, um, okay uh, so uh, you know, in these days of ours, everyone, uh, when we have a question, when we have a, a problem that we want to solve, where's the first place that we go and look for an answer? If you're going to say, I, I say the great oracle, but the great oracle here to me is, yeah, I, I, I say that Google definitely, Google, I would say Google, but uh, think of the internet as a whole, but Google is a very important representative of the, the internet as a whole. And what is Google if not collective intelligence in action? Right? The algorithm behind Google's search engine is basically our knowledge. Because, you know, the, 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 the simplest uh, part of Google, and, and, and it's actually the most effective of it, it, it was the one that really made it uh, different to other search engines that, that came before, was that, for example, if you look for Coca-Cola on the web, you're going to probably, the, the first website that you'll see is the actual company. Because there are lots of other uh, websites on the web that points to that address, right? The fans club or whatever, uh, maybe this is not, uh, this is a, not a, the best example, but other websites point to that one. So even if other websites are, let's say, visited more often or whatever, they see if they point to that one, they are, they're establishing some hierarchy. And this hierarchy that is established there is established by us. Each one of us, when we, we put a website, there we are already putting a little bit of our knowledge into this pile of knowledge that the internet has become. So I'm not, when I, when I say that we, we check for the, we, we go try to solve our problems checking with the great oracle, I'm not 
saying that we are going back in history to the ancient Greeks and visit, visiting uh, oh, Pythonese, I don't know how we say that in English, Py Python, uh, the, 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 the Greek oracles, uh, the, 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 the snake uh, that the Greeks Pythia, Pythia, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I think it's Pythia in, in English. I'm, we're not going to that. We're going to we're 21st century creatures, right? So our gods are different ones. But think of uh, the internet and think of Google and think of the, the even the, the social networks that we are also engaged in uh, these days. And, and when I mean social networks here, I'm meaning electronic social networks. Think of all those uh, artifacts as actually being uh, technological ways of building or, or, or helping this collective intelligence to happen. Uh, so I had a problem, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have anticipated that, uh, maybe, maybe I was quick enough to. Uh, once I was teaching this graduate uh, group of students in France, uh, and the last day of class, it, it's usually my courses there are very short, it's only two weeks or so because I have to do it many times during my classes in Brazil, so I have to go there, it's just two weeks. And at the end, the last day, they said, oh, this course was intense and everything. We wanted to give you a gift, and they gave me a bottle of wine, right? I thought, well, I, I, I usually like to, to travel light, right? So I decided, uh, I, I even thought maybe I should take this home and, and drink this wine with my wife, my beautiful wife. But then I remembered that she doesn't drink wine, right? So I said, I will have to drink this wine on my own tonight in the hotel before I go back to Brazil. It will probably make my, my, my travel, traveling lighter afterwards, anyway, yeah. uh, easier. As a 21st century creature, I didn't even think of going down to the concierge and asking him for a, what do you call, a bottle screw or something? Uh, is it is what you call, a uh, to, to, to take the, the cork, the, the, the cork, cork screw, right? I didn't think of going down and asking for it. It was too much trouble. I have to go down a few. Well, in France, it's always walking down the stairs, three, three levels or something, right? Um, I thought, I will consult with the great oracle. And then the great oracle very quickly started giving me answers. First one, I thought it was very ingenious. Yeah, they said, yes, you can, if you don't have a, a corkscrew, you can open a bottle by using a pipe pump. Right, you just put some pressure there. Very interesting idea, but I didn't have a, a bike pump either, so that didn't solve my problem. That was the first thing that I saw. And then I saw the second one that was also very engineering, but if I didn't have a corkscrew, I also didn't have a hammer. Didn't solve my problem either. The third one, well, the, the thing that they were asking, the tool here, I had in my, in my hotel room, right? But I looked at that and I said, you know, I, you know, my own experience says that this is not going to work very well and it's probably going to be messy. I won't even try it. So I keep searching. That all in, in like, probably less than a minute. Then I got to this. Do you know that this works? You put a bottle of wine inside your shoes and you hammer the shoe against the wall. In fact, I guess that you put it in the, 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 in the, in the shoe only to, so that the impact is better distributed and the cork comes out. Amazing, that was what Pierre Lévy was saying. Someone knows something that I don't know and that solves my problem, right? So this was collective intelligence in action. There are many other ways of doing this. If you look, and in fact, uh, there, if you look at the web for ways of opening a bottle of wine, you'll see that people get much more creative than that. But this was actually what did the trick, right? I was able to drink my bottle of wine without having to go down three levels of stairs just by banging the, the, the bottle inside a shoe. It's, you, you, of, I, I said that I, I got to that in less than a minute, but I had to watch the, the video of, guy, of the guy doing it, which took another five minutes or so. So maybe probably it was faster to go down. But 21st century creatures, you know, think that it's faster to just to concentrate on whatever the great oracles tells you, right? Besides, it was an interesting way of uh, doing it. Um, all right, you probably think uh, that I am a, a, an alcoholic or something when I show you the next problem that I have had. Oh, before that, remember, we're, we're not the first ones of, to be uh, dealing with collective intelligence. I mean, humanity has been doing that since we, for the first time, joined and did something that seemed intelligent, right? Uh, even if it was, I don't know, 
getting the femur of a, an elephant to kill another human. Uh, uh, not a good example either. But anyway, you're probably all familiar with this. Uh, if, uh, if I have uh, seen further than others, it's by standing upon the shoulders of giants. Right? Newton said that. And uh, he was calling giants all the other scientists that came before him and, uh, him, uh, and, and, and helped him uh, develop the theories that he was developing. But in fact, we as mankind are doing that all the time. Uh, and we researchers, when we're referencing, re referring other wor work of other researchers, we are actually doing that all the time. Right? But let me go back to my second challenge. This didn't happen in France. This happened in my uh, home in Brazil. Uh, is that a challenge to anyone? I don't know. I, I'm a, a, a home a beer brewer, right? I brew beer at home, and I brew beer for my friends. Uh, and I hate, I would hate if I had to buy bottles to brew or, or to put my beer in because I don't believe in recycling. I only believe in, this is a little off the, the, the of this, this talk here, but anyway, I think of reusing. Right? Reusing is sustainable, recycling, it only gives us peace of mind, in my opinion, right? So I, I, re uh, I reuse uh, bottles, and my friends keep sending me bottles. And I don't know if someone sent me that as a joke or to challenge me, but of course, the great, great oracle was around. I went there, and in less than a minute, I figured out how to do it. I will not tell you why, uh, how now. Maybe you can check later. But there's a f at least one very clever way of getting uh, a cork out of a bottle. Uh, and uh, someone else in the world had that knowledge, right? Well, this is collective intelligence uh, then for, for our group. We try to get diverse opinions uh, as decentralized as possible, as independent as possible, breaking away from hierarchy. When you have a meeting in a group that the boss is around, we're only there to say that the boss is right, right? That's what happens at the end. If the, boy, if the boss ex uh, expresses his opinion or her opinion, that opinion very quickly becomes the opinion of, every, of everyone. So that's not collective intelligence. That is the, the reinforcement of someone's. Uh, so we need uh, decentralized input. We need independent thought. We need diverse opinions. All of that is now available by means of our technologies, for the good and for the bad. Right? We're seeing a lot of. Uh, uh, issues developing, maybe Francesco is going to get into some of those later. In Brazil, here in the States, we, we have polarized elections due to our thinking. That, that's probably when we're not having the collective intelligence because we're not respecting everyone's ideas. We're not, you know, thinking of what does the other know better than I do? And we're just trying to impose our ideas and then we block everyone. We, we, I say that we, we kill everyone on, on, on our social networks. Everyone who thinks different, we say, oh, this person is boring, whatever. We, we kill them, we murder them because we put them away from, from us there. And then we never know about their opinions again. And we only know about opinions of people that think like we do. So we're not developing collective intelligence that we're just reinforcing our own stupidity in many cases. All right, uh, uh, with that, we, 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 we are, if, if we are able to develop that, that don't take that for granted. It's not as easy as it seems because it's, there is a great possibility of building stupidity as well instead of intelligence. Uh, but if we are able, if we're open, if we want to know what the other people's ideas are and everything, we can improve the for, uh, our, our ability to forecast the future. Uh, we, 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 we were doing, we were just checking uh, what people were tweeting, uh, uh, sorry, were tweeting uh, the days before last election in Brazil, and uh, of course we we did that after it had. I mean, we, we had all the tweets, we analyzed after the elections, but we got to the same, exactly the same percentage of votes that people had by just checking what the 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 the, 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 how the hashtags were in the you know in those uh, tweets that happened during the last 15 days before the campaign, and I'm saying. When we got the same numbers, we got the same numbers, points, something else, the same number there also, right? It's just one case, maybe a coincidence, but it's very effective to improve our forecasting if we, if we work with, with, with the collective intelligence of people. Uh, we discover and share new ideas, we augment skills and distribute over uh, uh, workloads. This is also something interesting that will probably be very uh, effective in the, the smart cities because we don't want to take the burden 
of changing the city to something that we believe that is better. But if we find enough other people that are interested in that, and if we work together, each one does just a little share of the work, and then it's something that is bearable. So we're, when we split the, the workloads, it makes uh, tasks that could eventually seem impossible become much, much more easy to happen. Uh, all right, second item here, understanding smart cities. Um, well, first, what is a smart city? I have already sort of anticipated here that our perspective to smart city is not the city that, that has the state-of-the-art technology, but it, it is the city that would use the technology that is available at a reasonable cost to improve the quality of life of its citizens. Right? So there's a big difference between what, for example, when IBM first mentioned or created the, the term uh, smart city, they were talking about their equipment, uh, their software or whatever, right? And we understand the reasons for that. It, they're obvious and, and, and they're doing business, right? But we are the citizens that are being affected by those companies. We, we want their technology, but we have to figure out if that technology is what we need uh, and if at the cost that is reasonable to achieve the results that we want. Um, technology helps uh, bringing together local authorities and citizens. Uh, uh, in fact, this is not just the, the new technology that we have now uh, in web times. Uh, uh, in my city, in the, in the 70s, the, the mayor already had a telephone line that people could phone uh, and complain about uh, situations in the, in the, with respect to the city or something. And the mayor established, but it was, let's say, a bi-directional channel, and you never knew how the other citizens were feeling. Right? Nowadays, uh, well, from the 70s to, to now, some 50 years later, with the technology that we have today, and with the, uh, considering the fact that we as citizens have demanded transparency, because, of course, when you start collecting a lot of data, you also want to know what is going to be done of that data, right? So in, in not only in, in, in my city, in Brazil, Curitiba, but also uh, around the world, the movement of transparent data has evolved in a way that now I can get the website of, uh, of the local authorities and get all the information of every interaction that every other citizen had with the mayor during uh, some specific time. And that's actually something that some of my students are doing. They say, well, if the data is there, let's analyze it, right? And when I get to the examples of what we've been trying to do, you'll see that some of them are trying to, to address issues that many people have already uh, shown to exist. Technology also helps connecting and empower citizens because it makes us connect to one another and know that others have the same problems that, that we have, and therefore, we're not alone, right? If we, if we, and and we, we, we should fight for things that we think that are important. And technology may, and here I, I put may in capital letters, may help to change expectations about stakeholders' roles with respect to the city because I expect, and, and, and our, uh, you know, we, 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 we're trying to do things in a way that the technology uh, is there to make the citizens become real citizens and not customers of the authorities. For many years, I think, because the, the, the communication between the authorities and the citizens were uh, sort of only bilateral and, 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 and we, we, we didn't have ways of uh, involving the whole community and everything, we were losing the sense of community in our cities. Uh, and we were becoming customers of our governments. If we can change that uh, understanding, if we don't say, oh, I pay taxes, so I deserve services, of course, there are some services that uh, mayors offer, like collecting garbage. It is a service. But at the same time, uh, if, if the, 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 the local authorities are not being able to clean the streets, and if we organize ourselves and we can make them uh, cleaners in another way, that is a result of us feeling that we are not only, you know, they're, they're not serving us only. They're representing us, but there, there are things that we can do ourselves. So I think there's a lot of even ways of building citizenship and making us feel more part of the, not, not only part of the, the problem, part of the solution uh, here, right? Um, okay, and then, uh, uh, so back to the bottom up strategy. We have to, to, as citizens, we have to feel that we can do things, on, we, we can demand 
uh, more strongly, but at the same time there are things that we can do ourselves. And then to some of uh, the examples of things that we've been trying to do, uh, please don't ask me for the rate of success of these things. Uh, we're still, in, in, in many of the things that we're trying to do, we are at, at a very early stage yet, but uh, students are enthusiastic about the idea because we all want to be part of our cities. For example, one of the students went there, got the transparency data from the city and noticed that there was you know, most of the problems or most of the demands and, and, and people and, and citizens still demand a lot there. They hardly ever are sending uh, a message to the mayor telling uh, that, you know, don't worry about cleaning my street because I will take that over from now on, right? They're, they're still demanding, but when uh, he, he noticed and he, he put it, a lot of statistics into that and everything, and he noticed that most of the problem, or, or this a very important problem, was that we had a lot of uh, vacant uh, lots in the city that had a lot of different to here in, in Brazil. If, 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 if some lot is vacant, uh, you have a forest there very soon, right? Uh, so there's uh, a lot of weeds, and then uh, people throw garbage, and then there, is, there are mosquitoes. A lot of problems related to that. Not all of them one a, a consequence of the other, but all of them related to, to one another. And he said, is there a way that we as citizens uh, feeling that that's a problem that we all acknowledge, is there a way that we can do something about it and change the situation? Uh, uh, this was a very, uh, this was a student in, in, in the computer science department. So he said, yes, of course, let's build an app to solve this problem. And uh, the, the app is perfect. Uh, uh, the app uh, does the following. It says, if you want to be part of our crowdsourcing um, um, effort, we will clean uh, these uh, vacant lots and we'll turn them into uh, squares that the, the people can, can use even if they are private property. We, I, first, when he first uh, told me about that, I said, is that legal? Uh, and then he said, do you think that the owner would complain if we went there and just cleaned? We're not taking over the place, we're just cleaning it and maybe if someone wants to put a bench there or something. so. This is one of the, pro the projects that we, we actually consulted the, the, the mayor, right? We went there and said, well, there's a, the university, we, we have this idea, we want to build this app and everything. And the mayor said, well, we can't tell you that you're allowed to do that, but we are not going to do anything against you. The police is not going to do anything against you. Get serious, you know, the police may go there and help you clean the, the place. And if the owner appears many times, there's vacant lots, we don't even know, know, know who the owner is any longer. If the owner appears, we, we can uh, ask them to pay the, you know, their taxes or, 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 or at least clean the, the, the place themselves. So that's one of the, 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 the apps that is being developed, an app to coordinate with the people in the neighborhood so that they clean lots. And the idea is, well, don't you want a place for your kids to play? During the day? Well, we'll just put grass there and if, let's say, 300, 400 people help, it will cost very little to each one and we will do that. We'll not wait until uh, someone else does it. Uh, something else uh, like that, another student was concerned with graffiti. Uh, he didn't have any data from the, from the government or, or anything. He just said, I don't like when I see uh, places with a lot of graffiti. And we're not talking about art graffiti here. Not that there's a lot of discussion about if that's an expression of art. But he says, you know, someone's house suddenly appears in the morning. There is some graffiti there. We want to crowdsource that as well. And he built an application for, 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 for that uh, where he tries to connect people that want to be, let's say, the, the observers in their, their region and see when anything happens. Before the graffiti person can show their friends, they want to have it already painted, right? Uh, so, and, and then uh, they want to have associations with maybe paint shops that will advertise in the website of the, the, the program. They will say, well, we are supporting that. We are giving the, the, the paints. Uh, we just need volunteers to go there and, and, and clean. These two projects are still, they're, they're still starting to develop. There is a huge challenge that is turning ideas that touch people into, you know, having people really put their own efforts into that. Even if, if we only need a few minutes from them every week or so, do not uh, underestimate uh, the, uh, the lack of time of people or, the, or you know, do, do not underestimate the fact that we became um, um, just uh, customers of the government and do not underestimate the amount of people that will say 
this is not my business, even if that's going to improve their, their, the place where they live. Right? Uh, so uh, we're still, we, we still think that this may, we, we may fight, uh, be challenged by not being, getting the momentum. It would be good if we had two or three of those projects happening so that we could advertise to others and show, yes, we can, right? Uh, but we still don't have those. Where we have already something is in a project with respect to accessibility, right? Uh, one of the students uh, also thought that, you know, we have Waze, we have uh, Google Maps, we have all these things that we use to, to, um, to make sure that we get faster from one place to the other. What about people on wheelchairs, for example, or blind people that don't even have the information on how to go from you know, a corner to the other because there may be a hole in the, the, in the footpath in the middle of the way. In the, you, here in the States you say sidewalk, right? Uh, and he said, it's not very difficult to solve this uh, problem. I can in fact get all the maps from open, ma open maps or there's, there's uh, uh, some free uh, possibilities to get that. He doesn't have to use Google Maps. Uh, uh, and then I can count on people's uh, willingness to help and if each, each person helps, you know, just mapping the block where they live, we can map a city very quickly. Again, uh, notice the technological part is the easy part. Uh, after that, uh, we'll have to really find ways of touching people, right? And uh, we have been struggling with touching people because many people say, gamify it. If you gamify it, it will happen. And we're sure it would, but until now, we're, we're fighting this idea of using gamification because we think that our society is already very gamified and we already uh, work on, uh, uh, we, we, we've already brought to our social lives things that were originally only in, you know, looking for efficiency and things are things that made a lot of sense when we, we wanted to be very efficient at doing the things that we don't like so that we could be very inefficient doing the things that we like, right? When I go drink that bottle of wine with friends, I don't want to be efficient. But we're becoming efficient in everything. We want to do everything very efficiently. And so we, we didn't want to make these projects efficient. We wanted to touch people. Uh, in, in this case, we have already uh, uh, gone a little further. It's, uh, it's, uh, it started because we saw places like this that were marvelous, but at the same time, there are sidewalks like that. Think of a, someone on a wheelchair trying to go on a street like that, right? And uh, so we, we thought, if we map this, we can, th then someone in a wheelchair is saying, I want to go from pay point A to point B, I can do that quickly, right? Uh, so this is a, a, a little architecture of the, the, the application. Uh, I won't get into details uh, about that. This is the application itself. In fact, oh, sorry, you were, uh, you can get the app uh, at move. Uh, the, the, the name of the app is Move These. It's in Play Store, um, uh, and uh, and then you can uh, you can mark things there, uh, good things and bad things. Uh, for example, having ramps on the street corners for uh, that that's very helpful. Here in the states, or at least in this area, we find we hardly ever find a street that doesn't have a, a ramp uh, at the, the corner, right? Uh, but I can tell you that that's not uh, the rule in the world. It, definitely in our city, it's not like that. So in the, the central areas of the city, you see the, uh, those things, but in other areas, not so often. And worse, sometimes you see there's a ramp at one side, and then the, the wheelchair gets into the, the street, and there's no ramp at the other side, which is a horrible situation. So uh, the technology is there. Uh, it's, uh, not, now it's a matter of... Uh, getting the crowds to, to take part on, the, on that. One, one easy way is gamifying because the, the world is gamified and when you, when you start having, putting games into this, the things really happen. We, that's something that we are, we're not doing yet, but we have volunteers uh, doing it. Uh, uh, here's some, for example, you can even choose, there, there's a lot of uh, things that you can choose, the, 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 the type of sidewalk because if it's, um, if it's rock and if it's an even rock, of course, it's much more difficult than if it's uh, concrete and so on. But uh, so there, there's a lot of things that you can do there uh, to mark things. Uh, I had my son volunteer, in double quotes, to map Albany. 
when he came back, um, uh, the, the, the advantage, we live in Albany. Albany is, is a small uh, town, right? So he mapped that over, I think, 14 hours uh, of walking around during a few weeks. Uh, and when he came back, back and showed me, and I said, gee, why do you have so many green spots in, in, in one area and all of the rest is red? And he said, you know that that's, those green spots are around where we live. And when we came, we came straight from Brazil. Two weeks later, he was doing that. He was finding everything was marvelous because he said, wow, everything is working here. So that he was doing that. When he started, and then suddenly, you know, he's 13 years old and think again about the intelligence of each one of us. And it's something that had not occurred to me. He said, you know, in a place like this, I don't have to focus on the good things. I'm not going to mark the green because there's going to be a lot of green. From now on, I will only mark what is not working. And notice that there is a lot also, right? That is not working. Each, each of these places are places. Sometimes it's, a, it's just, many times I would say it's just a tree that unleveled the, 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 the concrete in the sidewalk and made it bumpy or something. And I'd say that in some instances he became uh, more loyal than the king, as we say. He, he was becoming, you know, when a pla in a place that things are almost perfect, we have to be cl even closer than that to perfect. So when I say that there was some intelligence here that we had to learn from, uh, I and my, my, my student learned that we will have to code this in a different way, allowing people to, depending on where they are, to focus more on some, some sort of uh, markings or, or, or others. Right? Uh, okay, so those were the projects. And now I guess we, we come to the, to, to the discussions of implications. Uh, uh, Francesco will go probably in a different route from here somehow, but the, all of the idea is we are empowered or we, are, or we have technology that allows us to be empowered. Uh, this brings us some very enthusiastic uh, possibilities, but at the same time, are we being able to deal with this? I mean, we are electing all these weird people to be our presidents all over the, the world, right? Uh, we are doing we do not, we, it, it doesn't seem that all the times we are using the collective intelligence to make us uh, better. It seems that we are, many times, we are only focusing on grouping with other people that think exactly like us to say that those that think differently to us are doing it wrong or, 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 or shouldn't or don't deserve uh, to think different than we do. And, uh, and, and I say that this, uh, you know, I've been reflecting a lot about that, and I say that even those that think that are very democratic, we are not that democratic. We really love those that think like we do, and we hate those that think differently. Right? Thank you. Right. Sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Miriam. So, after uh, the rich and colored uh, presentation uh, <laughs> about uh, the, the, the general topic, just a few words about uh, the legal implication of this uh, approach, bottom-up approach uh, to smart city. Mm. In particular, in the light of environmental law, why, why? because uh, the, the, this topic of uh, involving private parties in uh, governmental activities or activities of general interest is, uh, has been particularly addressed by scholars and by case law in relation to the regulation of uh, environmental issues. So we'll try to see together uh, how private actors are encouraged to intervene in environmental matters, the so-called uh, environmental democracy, and, uh, and how this uh, may trigger a specific public law liability. So the, the problem, the side of a liability, of a responsibility, particularly in the light of a public law. Why? Because I'm a public lawyer. That's the reason. Obviously, there are many other uh, interesting uh, issues of liability, privacy, privacy law, private law, but I will focus on, on public law and administrative law. The first uh, piece of legislation that uh, is uh, very important, at least in Europe, uh, is the Aarhus Convention that has been signed uh, to regulate the role of uh, NGO, the environmental rights uh, in uh, Europe. 
just in Europe. And uh, more specifically, the Euros Convention uh, codifies uh, three main uh, rights for uh, people, for citizens, and for NGO. The right to have access to environmental information, so the so-called uh, environmental transparency. In practical terms, uh, uh, public authorities are obliged to make available also in terms of uh, informatic uh, and uh, data, uh, electronic database uh, all the information that they have about the environmental situation of a certain uh, community. Second, the right to participate to the environmental decision making, so to be an active part in uh, administrative proceedings that uh, deal with environmental issues. And third, the right uh, to have access to the court, so uh, the right to review procedures which uh, may be able to challenge a public decision in an effective way. So more in general, what is the, 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 the main purpose of EUROS Convention or the European legislation on, uh, environ, on environment? Is to consider the environment as a collective asset, asset as a, a public good, and therefore to make possible to all the citizens, to everyone, to exercise, if he wants, an active role in protecting the environment in uh, implementing, uh, in enforcing uh, the environmental public law regulation. The definition of the public concern contained in the Oros Convention make a specific reference to NGO, to private association of citizens, and says that uh, the, uh, the uh, condition upon which NGO may participate to environmental law enforcement is, are, are regulated by the national legislation. However, the implementation guide make, makes it clear that uh, this uh, national, this domestic legislation <laughs> need uh, to be interpreted and uh, and implementing in a way to, to make uh, effective the participation of an NGO to the regulation of environmental issues. So it's, it is true that the national jurisdiction may regulate, have the right to, have the power to regulate, to implement the condition upon which NGO are entitled to exercise an active role in environmental issues, but at the same time this right is uh, to be exercised in the light of the general purpose of the Oros Convention. Now, uh, the presentation of Alexander trigger, in my opinion, a main question. Is it possible? And most of all, it is opportune to shift from a formal definition of NGO to a more a broader and informal definition of NGO so to comprehend as NGO, so as entities entitled to exercise a number of environmental responsibility also groups uh, set around the new technology as, uh, in these cases, applications. Why this could be beneficial for the enforcement of environmental law, in general of a public law? Because it's a way to minimize transactional cost. Obviously, if you set up a formal organization, you have cost, you have an organization, you have uh, a certain lack of flexibility, why a, an informal uh, organization created around uh, just uh, an application is much more probably flexible, less uh, costly, I'm sure less costly, and so this could uh, represent uh, a step forward in my opinion. 
So what is my opinion? My opinion, my view is that uh, probably the old convention, uh, the European legislation uh, about uh, the participation of NGO, and not only the European, but all the legislation or the principle, the legal principle about the participation of an NGO to environmental law, to public law, should be probably uh, refought in a way to extend the possibility of an active role also to informal association and to application, etc., etc. And uh, technology is always evolving, and also the laws, the law needs to evolve uh, together with the technologies. Obviously, there is uh, a problem. The problem of guarantees. Uh, the, uh, the general principle of public law, no discrimination, due process of law, access to justice, because, uh, please. Just saying that, uh, at least in Europe, uh, for uh, the time being, uh, an informal NGO, for example, uh, an organization that is not stable, that has been created around uh, an application, should not, uh, will not have uh, any role, even by the law, in enforcing uh, environmental law. Why? Uh, why, in my opinion, <coughs> this is a limitation, a limitation that, uh, in light of the new technologies, probably now, So now the European legislation or the, the legislation of uh, most countries, and I think of all countries, would not recognize a public law to uh, an application, a group uh, working around an application. And why not? Why not? If it is true that this group can work so effectively as explained by him and uh, uh, may cost less. May, may be more effective, especially in a, at a local level. So I, I, I guess that the reason is that it, 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 in order to, to certain spontaneous groups, uh, in order to have a kind of legitimation to propose an action, for instance, in front of the court, uh, or to propose other kind of administrative remedies, uh, they, they need to be recognized by the law. So usually under the European law, uh, it doesn't exist uh, this idea that you can recognize a spontaneous organization.
support if those informal groups also have a possibility of, uh, of being, uh, being seen and being represented uh, in ways that they can't, like, because one of the, I say that what, uh, we, we feel that some of these projects are not going to succeed due to lack of uh, support of people afterwards, because people have to really be committed with that, with that. but also maybe they need it longer, they need to persevere, uh, and they don't have, incentive, they don't find the incentive in the, the society, even support from, uh, from, the, legal system. from the legal, not only the legal system, but the legal system also, yeah. Uh, uh, NGOs get a lot of support. You know, if a guy like this that did uh, uh, some project in a master's course, you know, he would say, well, this is good, keep doing it. Take, uh, go into a doctoral program and keep working on that because we believe that can go further. There is a good chance that what was just an idea becomes something uh, really powerful. Uh, otherwise, it will die. Uh, or there is a great chance that it will die. So it's, it's just, uh, I think yeah, this no, is what we're saying. Absolutely. about uh, responsibility, we, at least in, in, in uh, Europe, uh, we think about the uh, European Convention on Human Rights because it's the main piece of international uh, law about uh, public law responsibility and legal principles. Uh, this convention, um, as, a, as a court, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, that was very important, at least in Europe, because <laughs> it uh, issues a lot of principle, also about environmental protection and uh, as we'll see about uh, the responsibility that uh, private actors uh, entrusted with uh, public governmental tasks has to comply with. Uh, the European Convention of Human Rights uh, in fact uh, has no direct uh, horizontal effect but just a vertical effect mm. so to be subject to the principle of the European Convention of Human Rights, you have to be qualified as a public entity, a governmental entity. If you are just a private entity, you are not subject to this public law principle, because they are public law principle. They are principle applicable to entities that as are viewed as a part of a, of a state, of a government, not just a citizen, not just When a corporation, when an association, when an informal association is uh, exercising for a, a choice, for a decision of a given state, a public function, then the principle of the European Convention of Human Rights has to apply. Why? Because as the Strasbourg Court has uh, said uh, many times, uh, states cannot evade their duty to protect the human rights by outsourcing public function to, private, to the private sector. No? It would be too simple, too easy to elude the obligation arising from the, the convention. And uh, in my opinion, the most interesting case uh, about uh, this uh, complex and uh, debated issue is uh, the one uh, by the, the, the European Court uh, about 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 uh, about Poland because uh, uh, Poland, uh, uh, as you probably know, has received a lot of uh, war uh, damages from Germany because of the Nazi occupation, etc., etc. And uh, to, ad to ad 
administer this uh, money received from Germany and uh, to grant uh, this uh, compensation to its uh, citizens has decided to set up a private foundation, not to set up a specific uh, public body, but a private foundation at least formally um, governing this uh, delicate process of selecting who is entitled to receive compensation by using private or not public law. And uh, the European Court of Human Rights uh, said, okay, you have set up a, a private foundation, but you have entrusted this public foundation with a public task to administer money that you have received from Germany on the basis of uh, international treaty. So you have to respect, uh, to comply with uh, all the public law principles about, for example, due process of law. You have to organize, uh, to set up uh, uh, public law proceedings uh, which are transparent, uh, which uh, uh, ensure equality of arms, etc. Et but uh, the same position is uh, my, you, you can, can be find, found, in my opinion, in the case law of the, the European Court uh, of Justice, that, that is the Court of the European Union, so that, that is different from the Strasbourg Court, that is the Court of uh, the Convention, European Convention of Human Rights. And, uh, for example, in 1958, in the Meroni case, uh, the European Court of, uh, of uh, Justice said uh, that uh, delegation of governmental tasks to private actors is legal, so it's not uh, in itself uh, prohibited, but as far as it does not reduce the guarantees. For a, a very simple, in my opinion, and also convincing reason, because if you delegate something that you don't have, you cannot delegate a power that uh, you don't have. No? It's clear, it's, uh, it's logical. And when you are trying to delegate a public law power without the public law guarantees, you are trying to delegate something more that you have. Because public law is always limited by the public law guarantees. So you cannot uh, delegate, in, you cannot delegate uh, a public law power and at the same time reducing the guarantees. So the guarantees re need to remain the same same level of guarantees. So you can, you can delegate the public law power, but at the same time you cannot reduce the, set, the number of guarantees that public law provides. So the same conclusion of the, if you remember, of the uh, European Court of Human Rights. formal association can, and my opinion, should play a role in uh, implementing uh, environmental democracy and uh, should be protected by law, should be recognized by law, should be put in a position to, pray, to play a role uh, in uh, administrative proceedings as well as judicial proceedings. But uh, this uh, process of extending the delegation of public tasks or governmental tasks should not reduce uh, the guarantees. So even uh, informal association should respect all the, the main principles of public law, non-discrimination, uh, transparency, etc. So it should be uh, vested with the same, uh, in a way, privilege.
so far as a private association is uh, entrusted with a public task. But even informally, no? as, as in the case of Poland, in reality, uh, the Pol Polish government probably wanted uh, to avoid the application of public law by, set up, by setting up a foundation uh, governed by, by private law. Uh, it wanted to avoid uh, a public selection, uh, a public and totally transparent uh, procedure. No? say no. And if you don't let me push it further, would you go so far as to say that uh, the land use framework is actually uh, too conservative? Mm -hmm. I think so. I think so. Obviously, we, uh, then uh, we have to discuss uh, how to um, identify the boundary between uh, uh, public task delegation say this activity has been delegated even in an in implied way by the government to a private actor, then in my opinion uh, the main principle of public law, human rights, etc. must apply because otherwise it's too simple to elude the application of public law.
sequence of the fact that the human rights are established by international treaties, so they apply to state. Uh, international treaties apply to state, not to, not they have not a horizontal uh, application, but uh, generally speaking, vertical application. But uh, we have to, in, for uh, overcome this problem, we have to apply, in my opinion, broadly or in a more broadly way, the, pr the principle of delegation of. The, the, human, the European Human Rights Court try to, to do, no? to say, okay, you, in reality, this activity is an activity that's been delegated by the state, even if the state say, no, I, I didn't want uh, to, uh, to delegate any, any uh, governmental task. Forcible by third parties, by citizens. So the, the, the advantage of public law is that uh, when you are a citizen, uh, you can always uh, claim that uh, your public uh, uh, that your public uh, law rights have been uh, affected. 